questions everybody wants answered. Uh, coming up, we have the Mayor, uh, Mary uh, workshop on Saturday. It's about shared housing. So Mark does senior housing. Carrie does co-living spaces. Rocky does at-risk housing. And Tiffany does licensed housing. So, you know, the house has to have a license and the company has a license to manage the property. So if you are interested in any of those shared or group housing uh, opportunities and you want to find out how they all work, that is an all-day workshop on Zoom uh, on Saturday, this Saturday, coming up on the 11th. I don't know if you've met Charles Blair, the mad scientist. He's been investing in real estate for about... 30 years and technology is his big thing. So he is coming to us live on the virtual workshop on the 11th to talk about digital marketing for the real estate professional. And then coming up at our meeting on the 14th, um, Byron McBroom is joining us and he is going to tell us how to not, um, how to pay as little in taxes as possible. So it'll have some tips that the average person can use. And then for those of us that might have a little higher income uh, and want to have a second opinion on their taxes, he will have a second opinion for everybody that joins us. This is at our new meeting location um, at the Doubletree by Corporate Woods. So if you wanted to come out and join us on the 14th, uh, do that. And I think that's all we've got coming up on the calendar. All right, Dan. Did you find your way in? Can you hear me? I can. Well, I joined on the uh, what was on the uh, invitation. So uh -huh. I'm, in, I'm on this uh, Mary Lunch and Learn on Google. And it says I'm the only one here. So uh -huh. that's so. so oh, that, yeah, that's the Google calendar. It likes to tell you it take the Zoom link out of even though we put it in. It likes to take it out. Yeah, because I was like, why is it noon? And I'm the only one here. So I've. I thought, well, I better get on the page and see what the hell's going on. So, yeah. yeah. So okay. anyway, yeah, that's, I'm here. We, we got it all yeah. figured out. So that's that's good. So I want to thank yeah. you for joining us. This is kind of different. I was on your your radio show many, many years ago before they had podcasts and stuff. You were on the radio and I got to be your guest yeah. and now you get to be my guest. Exactly. It's uh, what do they have? They say uh, reciprocal shit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, reciprocity uh, first, yeah yeah so. first up tell us a little bit about dan reedy i know you've been investing for about the same number of years i have because i think you started right about the same time i did so tell us a little bit about dan reedy and what you do in real estate oh gosh you know somebody asked me that yesterday and it, 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 there's not much i don't touch you know i started almost 20 years ago um before the boom and everybody else was doing it was you know started wholesaling some houses and then uh uh, subprime was going so we decided to retail you know do some flips and do some retail i ended up with my own um i was in that branch of a mortgage company because subprime was going so well i wanted to be in control of the deals so i had a loan officer sitting in my office uh we were still wholesaling but it was really easy because there wasn't a lot of people doing it you know we we're making a lot of money and so when the subprime started going away um I mean, we literally had a Sorry, the, I forgot to record. That's, that's all right. So when the um, we had a deal that closed, literally, we showed her the house. Seven days later, the appraisal was done and she closed for the subprime. But because we were in that branch, we saw that as the subprime lender started going away, we said, crap, we need to get out of this. And because um, these people need to rent houses. So we started doing rentals. And then I had to be like, well, who's buying rentals? And who am I going to sell rental houses to? So I started researching it. And wasn't a lot of people in Kansas City buying rentals in the volume that you see now were out of state. So I figured out it was out of state investors. And I started learning that market and marketing. I had a speaking thing in Denver right off the bat. Didn't know half of what I was talking about, but uh, um, learned through it. And then uh, ended up with the radio show just kind of on a quirk I the people that own the radio station got one of my postcards to buy one of their houses and, and uh, Timothy Chen way back then had a show on that I was his guest I'm like what's it take to get a radio show They're like well it's you know a couple hundred bucks a week and come in for an hour and we'll record it and I'm like cool so so I did that for three years we uh 
um, that was good real estate investing for the regular guy, but a lot like you did, Kim, it, we weren't like trying to buy and sell properties on it. It was very informational. We had property managers, tax people, HVAC, any, the, the, we call it the good, bad and ugly of investing. And, um, and, and I like think that's Mary meeting on radio. No, really. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been here 20 years and still doing a lot of business. And I don't think there's a lot of people out there that think I'm a bag. So, and uh, because it's, you've got to create win-win situations. You've got to, if you're going to talk to a client, here's, it's not just the best case, but here's worst case scenario. Here's middle of the road. If you can live with worst case scenario, then, then I'm okay with you doing the deal. Okay. But don't base your buying on best case scenario and i've seen it happen you know just like you have so many times where they base it on a whether it's a bad comp or an old comp or a wish you know i wish it'll do this and the or, next or thing bad, you know, bad information period oh absolutely so and um it will bounce around a little bit but you know the last what let's say three years or four years or whatever it was, if you had a pulse and you knew how to throw, pro throw properties on the, on social media, most people are going to make money and decide they're a guru and, and, you know, let's, let's train and teach on throwing shit against the wall and seeing what sticks. I mean, that's basically the, the, what the strategy has been during this very low inventory, very high demand, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of gurus the last couple of years, you know, I've been doing it a year and I'm, I'm, I'm badass. And let me show you how to do it. I like, I've done uh, 10 deals yeah. this year there's, and I'm an expert. Yeah. And, and I'm not beating them up. God bless them. Cause there's a lot of people out there, you know, hustling, but they haven't seen bad times. Okay. You know, you and I went through the mortgage meltdown and, uh, and, uh, and that was a trickle down effect, but you know, there, I went from being, you know, a BMF to, uh, that's bad mofo to losing everything. I mean, and I wasn't the only one in the industry, you know, my, you know, a house, a car, my wife left me, uh, some of the biggest builders and good people and realtors, they were all bankrupt. I mean, I, there was a guy that was knocking down houses in, uh, Lake Lottawana building million dollar houses, putting out a good product, went to work for home Depot for $15 an hour just to have insurance, just, just to keep food on the table stuff. And we still had to buy and sell houses and make money during that. And we did it. Okay. Yeah. We, so, we pivoted but, the people that couldn't pivot lost out. Oh, because absolutely. You know, and it was, it was ugly, but the learning curve was amazing, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, cause I was in the car business for years and years and finance and all of that. And I kept getting offers, Hey, this sucks. Come back and we'll pay you six figures to do this. And I'm like, no, if I can hang on through this really shitty time when people are punching me in the face every day, because I owe money and times are tough. And I mean, it, it's like being at the bottom, but I'm like, I started out at the bottom, you know, it's like, you can't take anything that I can't get back. And I said, if I can weather the storm and come through the other side with the reputation intact and with my knowledge base, oh shit, I'll be badass. And, and pardon my language, you know, I'm old and, and I have zero filter, but no, but I was like, and, and that's one of the reasons my wife left me. She's like, dude, you're killing us. You know? And I'm like, baby, I, it's going to be okay. You know? And, and I'm telling you, it was dark, dark, bad times for everybody and but the whole time I was building relationships and what that down market did so if you think about Ruskin okay in 07 06 07 08 I was selling five six seven houses a month in Ruskin and I had a I had a all my rentals were fixed cash lower price points okay every Ruskin house was rehabbed to section eight standards, honey oak cabinets. I mean, not like really badass, but they were 59.5. That was the price point I sold at. We were pulling 70, 80, 70 to $80,000 appraisals, but my price was 59.5. And a lot of guys were getting, you know, 80, 90,000 out of them back then. When the market turned to crap, those people couldn't cash flow anymore because they were in them too high. My 59.5 guys, 
-hmm. They could drop the rent, still cash flow. Okay. So then I could buy all I wanted. Uh, Kimberly Killian's name popped up and I'm like, oh my God, I would call her like every two or three days because you could literally go into Ruskin and one third of Ruskin was in foreclosure at one time. Okay. And I just be like, um, I'll give 22 five for these five this week. Okay. Next week I'll take five more, just like it. And I was selling that same 59 five product for 37 five in Ruskin and some nice stuff, but because money wasn't readily available, I'm selling like on really high cap rates. So stuff in the hood for me, it was a high risk. I wouldn't sell more than a 50 times rent. If it rented for 800, my price was 39.5 period. Okay. Um, so, and some of those houses are worth, you know, $150,000 today. I had one that I sold in the forties between Paseo and true between Paseo and true. So like a Diable tutor, you know, one of the really cool brick ones, detached mm -hmm. garage. I sold it for, I sold it for 49, five rehab, four bedroom, two and a half bath. That house of braids is for two fifty now. Okay, so, but I made so many contacts that I still do business with because it was the guys that had money and said, you know what, at a fifteen or twenty cap, how do I not buy that? It's going to make money. I'll put my cash into that. So it was a lot of volume. It was a lot of low profit, and uh, you know, I had deals. You know, I'd make three or four thousand bucks. Let's go. That's three or four thousand bucks though in the bank, and. Uh, but people, I'm still, I mean, I post a lot of maintenance stuff and a lot of it's for the same guy. I've sold him 80 or 90 houses. I'm sitting in front of one of the first houses he bought from me because neighbors are complaining about some trees. And he's like, dude, he said, this is worth $150,000 more than you sold it to me in 2012. I'm like, I know you don't even send me a Christmas card or bourbon, you know? So, and uh, so fast forward. You get through the hard times, you come out and you're still just, you know, you're building relationships, et cetera. And uh, um, hedge fund comes to town and, you know, in 2017 and 2018, I've got my license, I've got my broker's license and they decide they want me to start selling them houses off the MLS. Okay. So 2011, 2012, bankrupt, broke, kicked to the curb. I mean, like death and destruction. Five years later, I'm the number one agent in the state of Missouri because of relationship building and a reputation and have a million dollar year in commissions off the MLS. OK, you, you, you talk about a swing and this isn't a bragging thing. This is you stayed in the market, you built relationships and um, and literally earned over a million dollars in commissions on one client in a year will never happen again. Okay. But when I was speaking at the event and everybody's like, Oh my gosh, you're so good. You're this or that. And I say it all the time. I'm not, I'm the Johnny apple seed of real estate. Okay. I've been planting seeds for 20 years. I've been building relationships. Sometimes my crop has frozen out and I get nothing, but I said, I've been planting seeds for 20 years and my crop came in all at the same time you know i got to harvest my crop and had a badass year so and uh, and uh, you had a lot of those. I, I i can tell you coming off of 2008 a lot of people got out of the business because they were like this is my box and i can't invest in anything but my box but those of us that were able to you froze there dan those of us that were able to think outside of the box and pivot like you did change their model i did more realtor stuff at that time i sold more to hedge funds at that time yeah. just like you did because that was who was buying houses that's who had the money and then then fast forward to the like the last three years everybody had money everybody's buying houses and you could buy a house and do absolutely nothing to it and it would appreciate in value in a month so you could sell it for more you could even yeah. do that overnight, sell it for more. And I don't think that's happening right now. And so that's kind of why I wanted you to join us today is what you're seeing yeah. out there in the market. Um, are, are the prices slowing down? They are. And the uh, and in that posting, that, that, that specific posting, 
was targeted towards Ruskin and the zip code 64127-64128, okay? Ruskin, uh, I, I've been in multiple, I've been, I've literally done, I don't know, four or 500 houses in Ruskin maybe. It's a ridiculous amount. And a lot of them I've done two or three times, but 64127, 64128, typically the two worst zip codes in Kansas City during this big peak you're seeing people take some big three-story houses with four board ups and shitholes on the same street and get $200,000 for them, okay? Well, that's a spike market, okay? When you look at markets, can't, the Midwest is not a spike market. We have ups and downs, but we're gradually going up and down and, until, you know, and appreciating, okay? So, when you look at Ruskin from 2013 to 2019, I think the for a three bedroom, one bath on a slab, the average sale price was about 50 grand, okay? 45, 50 grand, okay? From 2020 to 2022, that average sale price was $144,000, okay? Oh, so, yeah, so, I mean, it's a straight up spike, okay? Because of no inventory, people had money to spend the rates were good all they cared about was a if they could get a seven or eight cap and i'm like oh my god how do you do a seven or eight cap in ruskin i'm like scared to death for you but when you see a spike market same thing in one two seven one two eight when the market cools down it goes back down the other way okay and during that mortgage meltdown that's what you saw on the coast you know the the, the coastal markets the phoenix that went straight up, those were ones that took big hits because I've, I've researched all the different markets because my competitors primarily weren't in Kansas City. It was Memphis, Cleveland, Indianapolis, you know, Cincinnati, different markets. So I researched all the markets to watch what stuff was doing. So with that said, the peripheral markets, you've got to be really careful of. You've got to look at the spikes. If I'm looking at a house in Ruskin, and obviously, you know, a four bedroom, two bath, you know, where it was built that way, they didn't convert the garage. There's a handful of those that are cool houses. Those will hold pretty good. They're not going to lose their ass. The three bedroom, one bath on a slab or a crawl, they're a dime a dozen. Okay. If, if, if they bring a hundred thousand retail in six months from now, I'll be surprised, you know, maybe if they're granite and stainless steel but it's a three, one slab, 912 square, square feet. You know, what, what's your market for that? It's going to go back to being based on a cash flow scenario. Okay. What's the cap rate, not the retail rate. Same thing in one, two, seven, one, two, eight. There's not going to be a retail market in there. Okay. It goes back to a cash flow scenario. So, so you're so, seeing so prices I, starting to lower or. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, you're still getting one or two of the stragglers that bring good, but you know, I'm people are sending me stuff now and I'm like, you know, uh, somebody sent me a house for like 110 and I'm like, dude, I might give 80. Would you give 80 to five, you know, that quick, that yeah. quick, you know, my and, son was uh, helping a, an out of state investor on, she's like in the 127, 128 area. She's got a lot of rentals and he sold two of them in the 160s to 180s. And then he just listed another one and they're they're getting crickets now. And so oh. she's like, I should have got out faster, but she paid too much for them uh, in the last three or four years that yeah. they're not cash flowing the way she wanted them to. And she can't sell them now. So she's like, okay, mm -hmm. now what do we do? So if you're in that position, you only lose money if you bail, okay? So the market always comes, comes back, back around, okay? We're not going to have a crash. And even if we do, um, and I'm a little off topic here, but 2012 was the highest foreclosure year in Kansas City. There was more foreclosures in 2012. That was our peak foreclosure year, okay? And so doing this research for hedge funds, when I looked at that, I started busting out neighborhoods and to see what would do what you took out the hood and the Ruskins and you looked at uh, Parkville, 
Platt County, Clay County, Lee Summit, Raymore, your good solid areas from a year or two previous to the peak of the foreclosure, they didn't lose any money, maybe a percent here and there. And a couple of them went up a percent or two. Okay. Those aren't the markets that got hammered. There might've been some foreclosures in there, but people still want to be there, live there, raise a family there, and they'll still pay the money for it. Okay. So didn't lose much money in those markets. The biggest hits were the people that bought in the hood, the 127s, 128s, 130s, the Ruskin and paid way up for them. And a big percentage was for, was uh, investor foreclosures. So, but when you take good neighborhoods out, so same thing today, if you've got the, you know, a decent house, you know, a, a three, one, 900 square feet or a two, one on a crawl is not a retail house anymore. I, I don't care. You might get lucky, but I'm telling you, it ain't a retail house. You look at it from a cash flow standpoint and not a seven cap. Okay. Yeah. Your, your, your seven caps are going to be the, your, your A neighborhoods. Okay. Uh, the only people paying a little lower than it, than a seven cap right now are the big, big hedge funds that are buying in huge bulk that we're never going to do. Okay. So, so you've got to look at, is it, gonna, is it really a cash flow? Is it really a retail flip? So we talk about multiple exit strategies. If you're analyzing a house and you think it's going to be a flip, you've got to figure out your worst case scenario. What if I have, to, what if I have to rent it out? Do the numbers work for a rental? Is the, can I sell it to somebody as a rental, as a moneymaker? Can I get out either way? If my only exit strategy is to sell it retail and it's an iffy house, then you need to make sure if, if your only exit strategy is retail, look at your worst case scenario. If the market continues to drop a little bit and you have to fire sell it, then will those numbers work? Okay. So, and if worst case works and you're okay with the risk, then proceed. Okay. But just be a lot more aware of the risk. So when I'm comping stuff, um, I tend not to go, you know, the usual, you don't want to go across boundaries. You don't want to get outside of, of, you know, you don't want to comp 2008 houses against 1979 houses, et cetera. Doesn't seem like a big difference in year, but they're completely different styles. So what I'll typically do is go back. I'll do a smaller radius closer to my subject property. If there's not many, if there's not a lot of good comps right now, okay? And then I'll go back a little further in time and see what that trend is right here in the neighborhood, okay? Because it's, I'm not an appraiser and I, I'm doing this, I'm selling to my customer like I would buy it, okay? So I'll go back a little bit in time and see, the biggest thing I'm looking at right now is days on market. Your days on market, and for a while there in Ruskin, you had no actives, okay? In the day, there'd be 50 or 60 actives all the time, okay? Right, yeah. During, the, during the, the heat of the deal, there were zero actives in Ruskin, maybe one, okay? Now I think there's 15, 20, the, 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 there's a bunch of actives in there, and the days on market are getting longer and longer. So what that means is people aren't going to hold out for the big money. They're going to start dropping their prices to get them off their books. As those prices drops, it works the same way on, a, on, a, on appreciation as the invest, as a appraiser see properties going up. If one sells for 110, the comp's 110. If it sells for 115 now, the comp's 115. Same way, if it drops to 100 and then it drops to 95, and then it, they're going to see that trend. And so those values are going to come down because people aren't going to wait nine months to get rid of a house they should have got rid of earlier. Does that make sense? Right. And and then also, if they're sitting on a hard money loan, what is a hard money loan rate? Because for a while, hard oh. money was like 8%, but I bet hard money, I, I was looking at ground floor today and hard money is, depending on your experience, between 10% and 14%. And Absolutely. So money's And 10% is a, a bargain more. right now. 10% is a bargain right now, you know? Well, that, and, that's uh, a paper, but the average investor yeah. loan that they have is like 12%. Exactly, exactly. And so 
and again, if you're and if you're working in these marginal areas, then you've got the longer it used to be you could get in and out so fast because the market was that hot. That house sits for an extra 60, 70, 80, 90 days. Well, somebody's going to bust in, something's going to happen. You've incurred more potential risk on top of your additional insurance expense, et cetera. Okay. Um, we, I just sold a package uh, to a fund uh, of like 15 houses and I was checking on the vacants every three or four days. And right before the inspection was, I walked into two of them. It was gone. They took the cabinets. They took the, because they'd been set and empty that they didn't want to put a tenant in them. They were slow to pull the trigger to sell them. So they sat there longer vacant than they should have. And finally, somebody's just like, yeah, we're, we're coming in. Okay. They've been sitting there long enough. We're coming in and getting this stuff. So, and uh, so you incur more the risk. Copper? Oh, yeah. Just... It's what I haven't seen that many times where they pull the cabinets off the walls. It's been a long, long time since I've seen cabinets jerked off the walls. So obviously it's a contractor that is short on funds. It's somebody that knows, okay? Your average crackhead isn't stealing cabinets, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so- I had, so you a, I had be, a listing once, they stole the carpeting. I'm like, what are you gonna do? And this was like a 800 square foot house. I'm like, what are you gonna do with a five by seven piece of carpeting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it in my crib, you know? So yeah. And who knows, but, uh, um, so it's, it's all about, it's all, there's risk in everything that we do We're, there. There's still risk in real estate. Our risk factor is, is on the increase right now because we're in a transitional period. Okay. There's been enough. You can justify a higher price. If you go back, you know, if you go back even 90 days, but people are looking at six months ago, comps, Doug, a six month comp is not a good comp anymore. Okay. 90 days, you got to look at the trend. Well, it wasn't six months ago and, and, and follow that trend and expect it to drop. If you're going to hold that house for six months, you need to figure out what percentage do I want to anticipate it's going to drop between now and that six months and base your decision on that. Okay. Um, again the days on market is a huge indicator it's it's the first thing i look at now not price days on market because the more the, the more actives and the more days on market is is going to affect that price because people are going to start taking less and less to get them going so this is a kind of weird um thing on pricing that we've got coming up but you've lived through several presidential elections um and maybe you haven't experienced this, but I've gone into four presidential elections listing my properties and like the two months before the election, the three months before the election, everybody just stopped buying houses. I was like, it didn't matter who was going to win, but I didn't know if you'd ever experienced going through a presidential election and having that affect your sales and your, because you're dealing with hedge funds, oh. not the owner occupant person. Absolutely. Well, but, but, you know, it, it's that uncertainty, whether it's hedge funds or something happens in the stock market, people are just like, you know what, let's just sit tight and see what happens. And then once they get you, whatever the situation is, it's like the interest rates. Okay. Interest rates have gone up. I don't give a shit. Okay. That what the interest rate is, I'm looking at the rate of return for the client, whether it's a flip or whatever, if interest rates are going up and prices are going down, would I, would I, would I want to be at a 5% interest rate or an 8% interest rate and own the house $30,000 less? I want to be at a higher rate and the lower and the lower price point because rates will change. So, but people have to get used to it. So everybody's crying about interest rates, but they're not noticing that prices are coming down. The interest rate is just, one piece of the puzzle you got to look at what what's your primary concern what are you trying to accomplish if you're buying to hold and you're looking for cash flow what's your minimum return that you want for that particular neighborhood and you work the numbers whatever the interest rate is it's just part of it okay it's just like 
when when wood got expensive, you know, and plywood was expensive. Oh my God! Well, people still needed to buy it, so they calculated it in and figured out the numbers. Okay, yeah. So the interest rate is the same thing. I don't care about the interest rate because I've I've been there when they were even higher and sold houses and made money. It's not about the interest rate. It is, am I accomplishing what I want? To, what is my primary concern? The whole package. what is everything at it? Yeah, and and if it doesn't quite get there, maybe it's a contractor issue. Do you have, is there, can you save some money? Maybe you're over rehabbing for the neighborhood. And that's part of what like you and me and a handful of the good people out here that sell houses consistently for years, we are partnered up with them, okay? The first question we ask when an investor comes to us and says, hey, we wanna buy a rental house, we wanna do, we wanna flip or whatever. Tell me exactly what you're trying to accomplish I want to talk about your risk. I don't, you're, I'm not worried about your budget right now. I want to know what your, what your end game is. So I know which direction to send you. Okay. And if it's cash flow or a certain rate, I had one for a client earlier and, and it was a, you know, it was like Gregory and Cleveland, not a terrible neighborhood, but you know, we're pulling out walls. We bought it right. And we're making it just really nice they're like well shoot, we ought to put granite in here and then we ought to do this and i and i finally just said stop everything okay i said you're still you're still at gregory and cleveland you're going to spend an extra three or four thousand here an extra next you're not going to make at, at some point you're not going to make any money okay you can't over rehab for the situation of the neighborhood so don't because i've been there i rehabbed it like i was going to live in it and it's like well when you get the HUD, you're like, what? I thought I was going to make a lot of money on this. You know, and then you look at your expenses, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, the four or five things I wanted to do to sexy it up added up to 10 grand. So, yeah. So you also made a post because um, we've we've talked to a lot of the people that just got into real estate. They haven't been around through a market where, oh my God, it didn't sell. So you were talking about having backup strategies. So what are our backup strategies? If we're buying it, flip this house. How many backup strategies mm -hmm. should we have? And what, what kind of backup strategies are you looking at? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've way back in the radio show days, I have always preached multiple exit strategies, okay? So if when, I have a flip profit worksheet, I'm an Excel guy. So a lot of my stuff looks really remedial compared to the, the stuff you see online but it gets it done. And so on my flip profit worksheet, you know, I put in how much the, the house is, how much the rehab is, here's what the fees are. And here's my best case scenario and sale price, worst case and average the road. And it auto calculates based on what I put in there. Well, those fields automatically go to a, a just a, a single column for a rental. And so on a rental, I look at it and say, okay, I'm not going to spend retail money on it. I'm going to spend this amount of money. I'm not going to go quite as deep and does it hit my return there and then i base it on a scale of one to ten you know exit strategies if i can't retail it can i rent it and make money if i can't retail it can i rent it and sell it to an investor for a cash flow will, will it sell to an investor for a cash flow property so um so it's and it depends on what you're into. Some people will do the owner finance thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these wraps and the owner finance and the subject twos. I'm not a fan of some of it. And it's not so much the scenario, it's the people doing the scenario. But we can talk about that here in a minute and why. But um, um, so you've got to look at if this doesn't work, what are my other options? If I have, if my only option is to get full retail out of it to break out of it terrible deal yeah that that was what we looked at a lot in when we were rehabbing a lot for the investor was it had to be an investor priced house and the last four or five years investors have been paying three and four hundred thousand dollars for a rental property and i'm like really does that even cash flow but i guess with the high rental rates you it, it does but we were always looking at we wanted to stay in the price range of a house that if we couldn't retail it, that the investor would like it for a rental property or we could rent it ourselves. That was always our exit strategy. 
as well. Exactly. Appeal to the masses. Okay. So if you're rehabbing a three hundred thousand dollar house, you have you you have a very one sided exit strategy. You need to hope that you know that it's a kick ass neighborhood and there's not that that's very low actives, very low sales, and 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 that's something to look at too. There's certain neighborhoods. It's like. When a house goes for sale, people are like, boom, I'll take it. You know, Waldo, Verona Hills, you know, certain neighborhoods in Leewood, certain neighborhoods in Parkville where there hasn't been a hundred sales this year. There's been 14 and they all sold the first day. Well, that that's a no brainer. Okay, if you stay within that price point, somebody wants to buy it because there's not a lot of activity in there. When you look at 127, 128 Ruskin, and there's 30 or 40 sales a month and you got a bunch of actives, you ain't got nothing special. So, right. So, so um, I'll see. I, I, what, I think we've covered most of my questions, but you were talking about you're not a big fan of the creative deal making. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that creative deal making. Well, every guru is telling us to do that right now. Oh, well, because nobody has any money and they can't borrow money and, and they, everybody wants to get on the real estate wholesale guru bandwagon. So how do you do that? You know, if I don't have any money, then so, and they train you in these seminars to go, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, cover your mortgage. Uh, what do they call it? A subject to, uh-huh. and then, then you're going to mark it up and try to sell to somebody on an owner finance, and they give you ten or twenty thousand down, and then you're going to have make a little bit. You'll make enough to pay their mortgage or whatever, but you'll have that cash. The problem with that is, and, and there's a couple of guys in town that do this very well because they have the um, the the smarts to keep a reserve fund. Because if something happens, okay, so you get some young investors that do that, well, that cash down they get, that positive cash flow, that's not going into a reserve account. That's paying their salary. That's paying their bills. That's paying their advertising. There's none of that money left 30 days after they get that money, okay? So they're hoping to God that nothing happens. But We've seen it a million times. Okay, you get a tenant in there, something happens in their life, they can't pay. Maybe they trash the place, okay? And it's not their house, it's an owner finance. Like, well, I'm gonna lose my 10 grand, but we're gonna bail. The guy that's made the commitment to the owner that's still on the note, these guys don't have any reserve because they've spent that money for advertising and and their guru shows and living high on the hog and, and all of that. So now that how you've got a vacant house that nobody's paying the mortgage on. Sometimes the, the original owner doesn't know if, if, if the, the person doing the wrap or whatever has got the book and supposed to be sending the payment in and they don't have the money to fix the house up. And I've literally seen this, but this was a big thing. There was, well, there was another investing group where they say, you know, quit your J O B and um, it was, we met at Panera. They were all talking about it. I'm like, and, and those people got hammered because these owners ended up with houses back that needed 20,000 repairs and they were three months behind on their payment and didn't know it. So, so it's not, the, I think the strategy can be good if it's done right. Okay. But people are looking at it as a quick, get rich, quick, you know, way to generate cash right now they're not looking at it for a long-term investment. And I'm not saying everybody because I'm not going to name names when I'm doing rehabs for a guy and he's doing it. And, and when I first heard, I'm like, Oh, that's going to be. And then when I met the guy, I'm like, okay, yeah, this guy's doing it right. Okay. He's, he's banking this stuff. He lives very conservatively and he's put the deals together and he's got money and and not because he started out in house. He's not wholesaling that, subject to to somebody else that he doesn't even know oh no it, it he, he's doing it and holding it as a rental okay and so now i think he's got 26 or 30 of these that he's keeping himself getting that cash flow and uh and, and doing it the right way he's looking at it for long term as a business model so many of these guys 
it's sold in the jewelry packages, you know what, you can make a hundred thousand dollars this year and, you know, but it's, the risk is crazy. And I've seen owners just get burned and, you know, go, almost go to foreclosure because they didn't know what was going on with their house. They just thought, man, these guys have a good pitch. They're nice. They're going to do it. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh no, it's bad. You know? So, and then that's, and, and, and it's just like anything, you know, it's the scrutiny on the, uh, you know, the, the MLS people and, and all the stuff, you know, and, and the wholesaling without a license. The, the real estate commission really doesn't want to get involved in any of the stuff. They don't want to know about it until you start screwing people. And that, then they're just like, all right, I was trying to be the good dad, but I got to come in here and kick some ass because you, you know, you guys are screwing this up, you know, you know, property management, the, the Missouri and Kansas, the real estate people, property managers like the bastard stepchild until you screw up and co-mingle your funds or don't pay somebody or something else, then, then they've got to come in and do their thing. And they're pissed off because they're like, we didn't want to fool with you guys. And now you got this all screwed up. Now, so now we're going to have to enact laws that, to affect everybody. It's a knee jerk thing. So, so yeah, it's, it's really sad. And, and it's in every industry. There's 5% of the people that are doing things wrong, but they do it so egregiously wrong that they come in and change the laws for everybody to, stop yes. that five percent and so we that's one of our goals at mary is to educate everybody on the correct way of doing things and to tell them the what ifs to tell them the horror stories that might happen so that they're prepared and so that we are a better industry in kansas city so the uh, we don't get those horrible laws that they're enacting in a few other states but i you know i guarantee you there's a i don't know if we're watching now but a bunch of people you know new wholesalers and uh, there's a couple of new agents I'm mentoring right now that, you know, just have a lot of drive and go to, but, um, you know, that's, there's time people will send me a house and they're like, Dan, why, why aren't you going to buy this house? And I don't just say, because it's a shitty deal. I say, here's what's going on in this neighborhood for my perception. Look at your actives, look at this and look at that. You need to start being careful putting these houses under contract. Okay because here's what's happening. They're like, Oh my gosh, thanks. You know? And, uh, so it's, you know, I'm, I have people all the time. Hey, I'm looking at this deal. What do you think? And I'm like, here's what I like about it. Here's what I don't like about it. I'm not, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. It's still real estate. You know, I did that one posting here's, you know, big daddy's predictions for the year, you know, it's going to do this well, unless it doesn't, you know, so it's, you, you look at trends and do the best you can, but, it can still go the other way. I know. So just our, 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 our thing is to minimize risk as much as possible, not only for ourselves, but especially for our clients. Okay. Cause I know you do, and I know there's a handful of people here, but I can literally, you know, throw out a post and, and, and there's guys that, that, you know, I was selling houses to 12 years ago. Another guy I've done business with for 15 years, I'm still doing business with, on a consistent basis. And it's because I, I, I did a couple of maintenance things for him. He's like, and I just sent him direct to the vendor. I said, there's our Venmo, just pay him. Well, you want me to throw in some for you? I'm like, no, nah, I'm just gonna wait to a big one and hit you then. Or I really like bourbon and Christmas is coming up. You know, I don't have to make money on everything. Cause again, I'm still planting seeds every day. Okay. I, I'm the old guy, but I've watched, I, I've, I've watched the market come and go. I've watched the people that are very earnest and want to learn and do it. It's fun to watch them grow and be very good friends slash competitors slash associates. And then, you know, the, the shysty ones that, you know, the hot shot shit is just like, yeah, yeah. I'll see you when you're, when you when full of brushes get hot, you'll be the best full of brush salesman for that period of time. And then, you know, if toilet plungers get hot, you'll be a badass toilet plunger salesman. It's just kind of whatever you can jump into, you know, when mortgages were super hot, everybody jumped out, and got into that. And, you know, let's just bounce around to whatever's going to make me a lot of money right now. So, yeah, you, you were my biggest competitor. I mean, I remember back in the day, your name came up in all of our meetings. We're like, oh, here's this house. This is what Dan Rainey would pay for it. So, and this is what we'll pay for it. And then we'll go check it a month later. Oh, Dan bought it out from under us. 
We had a few houses. We were so happy because we had one deal. We were both, you were bidding on it on the same exact day that we were bidding on it. And we outbid you by a hundred bucks and the lady yeah. liked on better. <laughs> and, 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 and that brings up a great point. I have literally, because when I go to sell somebody, when I started doing this, I said, I never want channel four to show up at my door and say, I shystered some old little old lady out of her house. So when I'm talking to people about selling their house, the first thing I say is, what are you trying to do? And I'm not necessarily your best option. The reason you're going to sell it to me is not because you're going to go, woohoo, I made so much money. I did so great on it. I'm the guy that's going to come in, pay cash. I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to pay your closing costs, take what you want, leave what you don't. But I said, you have to determine what your fulcrum point is, because for me to do that, I'm going to take equity for doing that. That's a profit situation, okay? You can get more for the house. You can get a lot more for the house, depending on how much time and effort you want to put it into it. And everybody's fulcrum point is the same. Here's where it's worth it. And here's the point where it's like, screw that. I don't want to do it. And that's what you have to determine. I've literally, I, I said, a gal had a house for sale over in uh, uh, like Western Hills or whatever, you know, like Warnell, between Warnell and Ward Parkway. Killer oh, neighbor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, it was like 89th and, you know, between uh, Warnell and, and uh, Ward Parkway. But anyway, and uh, she priced the house low. It was too low. And I'm like, well, I got to go see this. And so she was just getting hammered. And so I look at the price and I, I walk through the house and, uh, and um, I said, I got to be honest with you. You've got this house price too low. I said, uh, you know, her best offer was X and I hit her 20 grand over. I'm sorry, I hit her 15 grand over her best offer. Okay. Not a hundred, not 500, 15,000 over. So, I mean, she had a way underpriced. I mean, it was, I mean, we're talking good times, good neighborhood. And we sat there and she says, so you want me to sign this contract? Don't you? And I said, I do not. I said, I said, until you decide you like me, you're happy with the deal and you're excited about doing I'm not going to let you sign this contract. Okay. It's almost the takeaway. Okay. And uh, so we were talking about it. Well, these other people did this and they've already come up 5,000. And, and I said, they're going to keep busting you incrementally because you priced it too low. They want to steal it from you. I'm the only guy that's come in 15,000 higher than everybody right out of the gate. Okay. So we're talking for a little bit and then uh, I'm at the table for like an hour, just shooting the breeze. And she's kind of just like, well, what do I do? And I said, let me ask you a question. If I did another 2,500, is that, oh my gosh. And she's pacing. She's like, that's awesome. That's amazing. She goes, should I do this? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you like the deal? Do you like the price? Oh, I love the price. Okay. And I said, tell me honestly, do you, do you like me? Do you feel I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do or that kind of thing? Because if you don't, do not sign this contract. No, I love you and you're great. And I said, well, then sign that contract, girl. And she did. And she was so happy. She got 20 grand more than her highest offer. And I sold the house and, you know, I didn't get rich on it, but I did just fine. You know, I made money, but I have had people come back to me and say, Dan, somebody offered five grand more than you did. Could you come up just like a nut? We really want to sell it to you. If you just come up 1500, we'd sell it to you. I've literally bought houses cheaper than what they've been offered to somebody else because of that relationship building, the planting of the seeds, the Johnny apple seed of real estate. Okay. And the referrals I get, I've had two referrals this year on houses. I've never hit, I haven't hit wholesale looks like this in years. I've had two deals this year over $50,000 in an assignment profit, okay, that were referrals, okay, that I didn't have to market for. Dan's the guy. I gave them more than what they wanted. And I mean, the houses were really bad, but the, but the, but the comps were good. And, and I guarantee you, the people that I sold them to, I told them, I gave them the price. And I said, because this is a relationship thing, too. I said, all right. I said, I got a great deal on this. I want to sign it. But I said, I'm making a bunch of money. Is that going to just freak you out? Well, how much you make? I said, I'm making like 50 grand, you know? Oh, we thought you were going to say like a hundred. That's a great deal for us. I mean, I asked the guy after he finished, I said, how'd that deal work out for you? Oh, we did great.
great. And I'm like, good. Okay. So, but I don't hide my profit. Okay. Yeah. I want them to know, because if you're freaked out about it, my relationship is worth more than five or 10 grand. Cause I'm going to sell you over and over and over and over. So again, everything we do is planting a seed and building a relationship. And that's how you end up being a, an old guy with all these young studs out here doing the stuff still fairly relevant and doing a just crazy amount of business. And now it just, it all just comes to me organically. I don't, I do no advertising to buy houses. I do no advertising to sell houses. It's just, it's just that network is there. And when I decided to get into the construction and rehab, because I had all these crews come to me, I threw a couple of blurbs out. And I mean, it just, local investors are having me do their rehabs because they're like, you're just as cheap as my internal guys and you're getting it done faster. And I don't have to babysit them. I just pay you. <laughs> that's great. You know? So, and cool. uh, yeah, so that's the, uh, but going back to what's a good deal just be careful, anticipate the downturn, you know, still coming. If you're not in Parkville, um, look at days on the market. Okay. And, um, um, and just be careful. And, and, and I'm telling you, I, I swear to God, if, 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 if you don't pull your horns in and Ruskin and 127 and 128 and, and then other little, you know, markets that were really hot, you're going to get stung. So and, I was talking uh, to uh, an out-of-state investor on that, and he was looking at like 30th and South Benton, and he was like, oh, well, I can buy it for this much, and then he was going to refinance it at like 160000 and I'm like, to hold for a rental, and I'm like, dude, you do know the values run. are going to go down, and you're going to get screwed, and he's like, oh, no, the value, I bought it so cheap. I'm like, well, yeah, you bought it so cheap, and you're borrowing your profit, but then you have this mortgage payment you have to make. And what if you can't? And so I was like, yeah, don't over leverage these puppies. Uh, yeah. Because that's what got everybody in trouble back in 2008. They were doing 105 real estate investor refinances. Oh. I don't know what bank was doing that 105%, but I know they were. Well, there was that local, I can't remember what their name was, but there was the uh, the local guys that were the they would loan money on about everything because they were living on what I call the $5,000 big. Okay. We're going to loan you money on these houses. You got to pay us five grand. Our fee is five grand up front. And so, but the guys that were doing it were making so much money on the five grand. They didn't really give a shit what they loaned on. Well, when their port, they had hundreds and hundreds of houses that, 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 that went lost. They loaned one guy, there was a house in Ruston when I'm selling them for 60,000 rehab, this guy bought one that needed 25,000 to rehab. They loaned him 60. They loaned him another 30 for the rehab and the house was only worth 60. And he took that money to pay off his credit cards or something and just let the house go back. Okay. And it went to auction and for like 22, went to like 22 grand or 23 grand. They lost like $60,000 on that but they were making five grand a pop, you know? And uh, yeah, so yeah, but luckily we've got a little bit more safeguards in place mm -hmm. so that the banks aren't lending crazy numbers like that, but the values of the houses were allowing crazy numbers. And I think the values yeah. of the houses as they go down, those numbers, well, to you and me seem crazy, but for the people that didn't see the $100,000 house go down to five grand, um, they think yeah. we don't know what we're talking about, but we watched it happen over and over again. $100,000 house was selling for five grand uh, in 2009, 10. Oh, all, all day long. So I made a, I drew a line in the sand a few years ago because again, you know, I've done a ridiculous amount of houses in Ruskin and I drew a line in the sand. It might have been five years ago. And as I see prices go up and I'm like, that's bullshit. I'm like, I will never ever sell a house in Ruskin to one of my investors for more than $70,000. I'm not going to do it, you know? And uh, I, we ended up getting like 185 out of a Ruskin Hill split. I was like, what the hell, you know? And they just went up so high and I'm just like, God dang, you know, it's just, but I do that line in the sand and I was so far off that it would go that much, but I started pulling my horns back on Ruskin a year ago. Okay. 
when people were still buying because I, I know it's it, it it's going to go, okay? Because it's going to go. It, so. Ruskin, like 80, 80 to 90 percent of all the homes in Ruskin, just like in the urban core, are all rental property. Absolutely. So that's yeah. what goes down fastest. Well, and, and still, if you drive up and down, and I'm not beating up Ruskin. It just has, there's 1,500 houses in there. There's a lot of activity, a ton, primarily investor activity in there that you can, that you can peek out. I mean, if I had all the money in the world, I would buy every single house in Ruskin. I changed the name to Reedy Acres, okay? And I'd have assisted living and, uh, you know, uh, handicapped accessible because they're a beautiful setup for a two-bedroom, two-bath, you know? But, um, you know, it's just, I don't even know where I was going with this, but yeah, it, it, half the neighborhood, if you drive up and down the streets, there's going to be some really pretty ones. And on that same street, for every two or three pretty ones, there's going to be four or five that you're like, man, I'd sure like to buy that piece of crap. You know, half the neighborhood is still just gross and crime and the worst school district in town, et cetera. So yeah. you just, you just got to be careful. I'm sure I'll be getting a letter from Ruskin Heights Homeowners Association. But, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like we're right at, at one o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, say we, we should wrap up here. I want to thank you for joining me on your lunch hour. Uh, you and I didn't get to eat, so we'll have to go 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 grab us some lunch. Uh, I'm not in danger of starving to death. I think I could go in another two or three hours before I waste away. So All right, cool. But thank you for joining us and sharing your knowledge. I'm hoping everybody out there on uh, Facebook land, because I wasn't watching Facebook. I tried I tried to run Facebook Live and have it up, up and it was putting too much lag on the screen because Zoom and Facebook processing at the same time does not work. So I hope we answered everybody's yeah. questions and gave them some insight. That if not, you know where to find us. Pardon? Absolutely. Well, thanks a bunch. I said, if, if not, they know where to find us. Yeah, where do we find you? How do we how do we find Dan Reedy if we want to get in touch? I post stuff on Facebook occasionally, but uh, yeah, it's I've had the same phone number for I don't know thirty years five eight one six five six four five two six five Dan Reedy at morekc.com and it's on my if you just go to Facebook you can DM me there you can look on my profile page it has my number my email address and and uh, um, I'm pretty active there so. And, and you're uh, also listed on the Mary uh, Business Directory, although it's 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 in process of being rebuilt. So, but yeah, you should yeah. be on the Business Directory as well. Absolutely. And then there might still be an old poster at the post office, but I mean that was a that it wasn't even me. They just it was crazy. The most okay. wanted. It was a joke. All right. No post office for you, but I think Google can find you too. You're, you're one of those people, you put your name in Google and you come up 47 times or 100. Exactly. So. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Dan. You bet.